fine. And um, we'll set our motivation by using the Heart Sutra. So we'll just take a minute and gather our attention and recenter and Heart Sutra. I prostrate to the three noble, oh, rare, sublime ones. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of Vultures Mountain in Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avlokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasa Arya Avlokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara said this to the venerable Shari Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic. Unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the venerable Sharivati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara and those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. From the holy supreme realm of Kachara, 
You who possess powers of clairvoyance and magical emanation, look after practitioners without distraction as you would a child. To the host of Dakinis of the Three Abodes, I prostrate. Aka Samara. Aka Samara Taya Daum Gate Gate Parakate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva. By the teachings of the noble three rare sublime ones possessing the power of truth, may hindrances be averted, may they be eliminated, may they be pacified, may all enemies and negative forces opposed to Dharma, Shintum Kuri Soha. May the host of 80,000 obstacles be pacified. May we be free from harmful conditions to Dharma. May all excellences be in accord with the Dharma, and may there be auspiciousness and perfect happiness here right now. And so just being with the Heart Sutra, negating inherently existent everything, in particular the five aggregates, the basis upon which we label self, those five aggregates empty of inherent existence. The teachings themselves empty of inherent existence. The karma created empty of inherent existence. And holding whatever awareness of emptiness we have, then we add to that a very strong refuge in bodhicitta. Sanghe churon sogi churam lai janchu padu dani capsuchi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki drola penche sanghe drupa sho sanghe churon sogi churam pa janchu padu dani capsuchi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Rola benje sange drupa sho sange churon sogi chunam la janju badu dane gapsuchi dagi jan yen ki pe sonam ki rola benje sange drupa sho reconnecting with that refuge in bodhicitta Okay, so I, I see some familiar faces and some familiar names and uh, some folks I haven't met yet, but thank you very much for coming. I think that it's very powerful to have this conversation in a group, you know, it's a conversation we have in our head all the time maybe, but uh, nice to be able to share it with others. So this, today we're mainly going to be looking at the wisdom side of the path. And I think that when we look at the wisdom side of the path, it's easy to get lost in philosophy and to get lost in words and miss kind of the profundity of the Buddha saying that everything is empty of inherent existence. By him saying that, it helps prevent Buddhism from becoming fundamentalist. Of course, human beings can become fundamentalist, right? We'll do that to anything. We can do that with, you know, fiction. <laughs> we can do that with everything. But in Buddhism to say, here are all the teachings. They're wonderful, profound tools. Use them as you like. None of them exist from their own side. None of them exist in and of themselves. All of them are dependent arising. It means that we don't fixate and cling and get into false ideas about 
this is right forever and always divorced from context, right? Which is the danger of fundamentalist thinking to think if this is true, it's true in this exact form in every single context, which is not the case. We need to have a flexible mind that knows what is bodhicitta look like in this situation as opposed to that situation. We want bodhicitta, but what does that mean? You know, so this is a really important teaching for us to kind of unhook from, I guess, clinging and tightness and becoming dogmatic and rigid. But it's also an invitation to not go far, too far into nihilism or eternalism to think that because things aren't inherently findable, that they don't exist at all. That's also an extreme. And that can lead us to apathy, depression. It can also lead us to like hedonism and it's all good, it's all good and sort of making everything fine, even if it's not. So we just kind of want to land ourselves in whatever we understand the middle way to be. And then we tidy up the edges or the like bumpers of the two extremes that exist in our mind gradually over time so that our middle way becomes the correct middle way that really will get us out of samsara. So that's kind of the background um, for what we're talking about today. Um, if we're gonna be talking about wisdom, it's good to remember that in Buddhism, a tidy framework is to think of things in terms of the basis, the path and the result. So when we talk about the basis, we're talking about the true truths, yeah, relative truth and ultimate truth. And that discussion is just like Buddhist science. Yeah, the discussion of the basis of relative truth and ultimate truth, that's a philosophical discussion about reality, which is useful, but what do you do with it? And that's the conversation about the path, right? So then the path is method and wisdom, isn't it? Method is related to our understanding of relative truth. Wisdom is related to our understanding of ultimate truth. And eventually those practices can become combined and unified, but that's kind of how it goes, isn't it? There's how things are, and then there's what we do with that information. And then what we do with that information leads to the result, the two Buddha bodies, sometimes elaborated into three or four, but basically the form bodies of a Buddha and the wisdom bodies of a Buddha, which are what we need for both ourself and others to become completely, I guess, beneficial in a way that's not mistaken. Not our everyday educated guess, I'll try to help people, but beneficial in an unmistaken way. So we need the form bodies of a Buddha, the Sambhogakaya, the Nirmanakaya, the enjoyment body, the emanation body, we need those to benefit others. We also need the wisdom bodies. Yeah, the nature truth body and the wisdom truth body. Those dharmakayas are essential for our own getting out of samsara, realization of the nature of our mind, et cetera, et cetera. So those of you older students who know this framework, don't lose that framework. <laughs> Basis, path, result. Don't lose that framework. And you newer students, try to really hear this is a very elegant way of organizing your thoughts so that you don't get overwhelmed. That basically everything can be categorized into basis, path, result. And it all has that line straight down the middle. That's which is related to the relative, that which is related to the ultimate. Yesterday, we were talking about the relative. We were talking about karma, we were talking about cause and effect, and all of that is essential information for us as practitioners. Do you have any hanging thoughts about karma before we go into the wisdom side? Just, you know, having slept on it and molded over? Karma issues? Hi, hi Venerable. Go for it. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, two things. Uh, one is uh, related to karma in a in a day to day sense, okay, and one in in metaphysical sense. Okay, so I mean, I don't know if we'll have time to go through both. Okay, so the first one is uh, 
about you know not taking action when you know when we see something that's incorrect right so uh, so this is like a philosophical question right when when you hear when you see that someone is uh, doing something bad and we don't intervene mm -hmm. so what kind of karma do we accumulate for inaction well it depends on your reason doesn't it remember how karma is essentially mental intention although there's also within the karma category speech and mind or excuse me speech and body so you have to ask yourself am i not acting because of wisdom because i know i won't be effective because i know this isn't my time or my skill set or am i not acting because i'm afraid am i not acting because i'm lazy right there's a million reasons for not acting so it's about this really deep self-honesty that asks yourself, why? Yeah, the outer actions are important, but they're never as important as the intention. And so just keep coming back to why did I not act? Because it might have been just solid common sense of I didn't act because it wouldn't have helped, <laughs> right? But sometimes we don't act because of some sort of complacency or laziness or ego fear. Yeah. And in those cases, you know, purify, do better next time. Yeah. Okay. And don't don't over identify as the one who didn't act. You know, we didn't act yeah. a million different ways in a million different lifetimes. Start again, <laughs> you know, start again, do better next time. Yeah. She Shivana, did I say that right? Did you have your hand raised? Yeah, my name's Shivani. Shivani, Hi. nice to meet you. Come on in. Namaste. Yes, uh, I had this question which I've been riddled with for the longest time. When we talk about uh, the karma of loving kindness to self, mm -hmm. right? And you're in a certain uh, relationship where there you feel uh, the person is deceiving, right? Now, allowing another person to deceive you also brings about a karma of gullibility, I, in my understanding. So, uh, but like you just uh, were responding to the question, that's when it occurred to me when you were talking about, uh, it, it, it is about the thought and the inner process, but sometimes we feel um, helpless is not the word, but you understand that for you, the right path is still practicing love, kindness and forgiveness versus, um, but then it allows the other person to deceive you. So. Uh, for me, it's been a puzzle for a long time. I don't know if I could articulate it uh, properly. So how do we transcend that kind of uh, uh, um, and, you know, situation and uh, yeah. bearing the root to put the right seeds and get reap the right fruits? Yeah, it's, it's an important question. Uh, you're not alone. You know, there's, it can feel like a contradiction or a paradox, our inner work and our outer work. Because our inner work of loving kindness is just, may you be happy. Yeah, no expectations, no pressure, no conditions, may you be happy. But then externally, good boundaries, <laughs> good communication, right? Um, making sure that people aren't being taken advantage of or taking advantage of others. You know, all of that like good common sense stuff about, you know, daily life that just is practical you know and how do you reconcile that with may you be well may you be happy don't take advantage of me don't take advantage of others right don't walk all over me don't be a whatever jerk um yeah and it, and we just have to keep remembering that allowing people to continue bad behavior is not good for them yeah that a brave way of having love is being brave enough to know that a confrontation might not bring a fun day, <laughs> right? You might have a really kind of a difficult jangly day if you're speaking honestly and directly about something important. I think the important thing is that you start from a place of calm. Yeah, because a place of calm means that afflictions haven't started to drive, which means your creativity is open to you and your wisdom is open to you. 
you know, when you get really uptight about trying to fix something with someone and you plan it and plan it in your head before you see them and you can get really uptight about, I'm going to say this and this and this, you know, and when they come back at me, I'm going to say this and this and this, and you get really tight and agitated and your attachments all inflamed and your anger is ready to jump in and like help. Right. And what happens then is that you collapse creativity. You suffocate creativity and you like you're doing a preemptive strike, assuming what's going to happen instead of being with what's happening. So it's such a a brave stance to say, I deserve happiness. They deserve happiness. Everyone deserves happiness. Greater good happiness. (laughs) Anchor yourself there. Reconnect there. And then just listen deeply for opportunities to bring out wisdom in the other person. You know, so you're listening really deeply for, you know, times in which they're not being afflicted. They might be rambling on about their story and their side of things, and it's all full of distortions and afflictions, but there's little pockets of brightness. There's little moments of truth where you're like, okay, they're right about that. I shall extract that, say it, and give it back to them. (laughs) And maybe they will sort of take that to the forefront of their mind and also feel loved and seen. You know, so it's very delicate. You're, you're not alone. We're all in this same boat of how do we maintain these beautiful ideals that seem so simple until you talk to someone, <laughs> until you have another human being in front of you. And then suddenly it's complicated and not so linear and not so tidy. Thank you. That was really helpful. One more question. I don't know sure. if I'm dead away from the topic, but um the practice of detachment is something that I just struggle perhaps the most with. Um, I do not understand. Um, I've tried to study it, but my mind is unable to comprehend it to the depths that it can come to into practice. So if you could mm. help me, if it's not deviating from the topic. Yeah, I mean, you know, detachment is always related in Buddhism for sure. So Um, you know, craving and attachment is part of what keeps us in cyclic existence. You know, ignorance is the underlying issue, but because of our ignorance, we have all this craving and expectations and attachments. So the simplest way to talk about it is to just remember detachment is not disengagement, right? So you can be detached and objective and have some space and de-identify from your role in everything while being fully present, fully engaged, fully invested and taking responsibility. So it's, it's almost like, remember when you're a child and you're playing a board game and you're in charge of one little piece on the board? If you're not too invested, you have so much fun If you're overly invested, you get very uptight. And even when you win, there's a lot of stress involved. You know, can we sort of come back to playing the game in this kind of like detached, joyful way where we're just moving our piece in the area that it seems most useful, but it might not work. (laughs) You know, there's just a little bit of space there. Or another example is if you're watching an action movie with lots of explosions and lots of tragedy and lots of romance, but you're watching it with your best friend. And so you're just sort of chatting and then going, oh, that was a cool explosion. Anyway, chatting, chatting, chatting. Whereas if you're watching it by yourself, the explosion might make you jump and the tragedy makes you weep and the romance touches your heart and you're like in it. And then by the time the credits roll, you're just like recovering, (laughs) like, wow, that was a good movie, (sighs) you know, (laughs) and it's like nothing about real life, but you're somehow still recovering from it. So we want to have that like detachment where we're fully aware of, oh, wow, look at that beautiful scene. But anyway, (laughs) right. But anyway, it's just a little bit of space in there, whatever kind of analogy gets your mind into that headspace where you're present, but not obsessed with it. You know, not manipulating it, not all tangled in it, just kind of observational, participating when it's useful, stepping back when it's not, 
not too identified with your own character in the play. So that was a number of mixed metaphors. <laughs> so <laughs> pick the one that you like. <laughs> Thank Make you so much. That was beautiful. Sure. sure. Okay, so we're going to do a very, very quick recap from yesterday, just so we don't lose what happened, and then we'll move on to some wisdom stuff. And just like yesterday, um, we'll do a meditation at the end of the session, and um, there'll be a little five-minute break before that, in case you need to stretch your legs, so um, not to fear. So yesterday, we talked about the Four Noble Truths, because to say uh, karma and reality is to talk about the Four Noble Truths. So we talked about the first noble truth, the truth of suffering, not in as much detail as the second noble truth, but I think that suffering is known to us. <laughs> so it's not something that we need to hammer too much in this particular class. The pith here is to keep remembering, like this verse from Lama Chopa, that there is no difference between ourselves and others, that none of us wishes for even the slightest of suffering nor is ever content with the happiness we have. Realizing this, we seek your blessings that we may enhance the bliss and joy of others. So we're just, you know, not forgetting that the Four Noble Truths are there and important and that first one is so true and it's an effect of karma. And then the second Noble Truth, we did a lot more in depth. We talked about disturbing emotions a little and their influence in developing karma. And the summary or the way to frame it for yourself is to just remember, should even the environment and the beings therein be filled with the fruits of their karmic debts and unwished for sufferings pour down like rain, we seek your blessings to take these miserable conditions as a path by seeing them as causes to exhaust the results of our negative karma. So first and second noble truth, we see how we have suffering, it leads to disturbing emotions and karma, which lead to suffering, which lead to disturbing emotions and karma. And here is the problem. We're thoroughly convinced. Now we're in the mood to look at what to do. So the upgrade of that conversation is the 12 links. And I'm not gonna do a whole presentation on the 12 links. This is more for those of you that know this framework, just to kind of keep you connected to the um, deeper teachings on karma. So the 12 links of dependent arising are described in the outer ring of the scary monster, right, that he's holding. And this is basically how cyclic existence works. The reason this is an important conversation is that in these little pie pieces or in these little sections, these 12 sections, there are different opportunities to break the wheel. And we want to find those little weak junctures where we can break the wheel and stop having uncontrolled rebirth. So here's the way, the order that you're used to seeing them taught, which is the order that they're described in this picture. Let's shift to the order to grouping them differently, okay? So in terms of afflictions, disturbing emotions, we've got ignorance, craving, and grasping right? And craving and grasping aren't just wanting, they're also wanting to be separated from what we don't like. Then we have the suffering, consciousness, name and form, which relates to the five aggregates, six sources or the six sense bases, contact, feeling, birth, which refers to rebirth, aging and death. So these are all under the category of suffering. And then the ones under the category of karma are karmic formations, the guy with the pots, and becoming or potential existence, the woman giving birth. Yeah. So what we want to do here is find ways to break at these different junctures, right? And we're used to this conversation in terms of lojong or mind training. So for example, to break the link between afflictions and karma, we apply Lojong, remembering Shantideva stuff or Geshe Longri Tampa stuff. This interrupts the flow, right? So, you know, you're feeling unwell physically or mentally. You're about to give in to a mood, 
how do you stop yourself from giving in to your normal association of if I feel bad, I must do bad in my mind or in my behaviors. And you refresh yourself with things like compassion, loving kindness, etc. That's this is all on the method side, isn't it? So then we think, okay, well, sometimes I miss my window. You know, I have this window of opportunity where suffering could lead to afflictions, and it did. I'm grumpy. I'm speaking critically, I'm being withdrawn, I'm being passive aggressive because I am grumpy. Now I'm about to do something. <laughs> I'm about to say the unkind thing or reinforce the unkind mood, but you can prevent that. So to break the link between afflictions and karma, you really wanna ask yourself, do I wanna keep doing this? Yeah. And then between karma and suffering, because it's too late sometimes, you did the wrong thing. Karma not leading to suffering, we have Vajrasattva, meditation on emptiness, lots of things you can do to purify. If you miss your window, oh well, you're suffering again. You can still break that between suffering and afflictions. So the point here is that these are a lot of words that you are either familiar with or you're not. But the issue is that you never lose hope. Even if you keep doing the same old thing again and again and again, there's always a chance to change the pattern or to slow the pattern. Yeah, or to interrupt it in some way. Okay, so this makes us say, we like Vajrasattva, Vajrasattva practice is good, four opponent powers are good. Let's also look at using the wisdom realizing emptiness because we don't want just symptoms relief, we want the cure. So the third noble truth is the truth of cessation, referring to the end of disturbing emotions and karma through realizing reality. So it's actually in a way true cessations, plural. You know, you have the wisdom realizing emptiness at the path of seeing, but then you need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And each cycle, you're clearing eons of negative karma. So how do we do this? Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space like yoga of single minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena like true existence yet still appear, like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. So basically you need your concentration, you need to unite your concentration with analysis, you need to unite your concentration and analysis with wisdom, and then you need to practice seeing the illusory nature even out of meditative equipoise. So in meditation and then out of meditation. This is a summary and some of this is familiar and some of it isn't, but just kind of really touch base on what parts of those verses ring true to you or evoke something within you. This is our project. And then, so it, it makes us really seek the method, thinking in this way. It's like, oh, I haven't gotten rid of my dullness and agitation and mental wandering. I haven't gotten my perfect concentration or my wisdom yet. I want to. And so we think samsara, cyclic existence, and nirvana, the state beyond sorrow, lack even an atom of true existence, meaning inherent existence. While cause and effect, karma, and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought that these two are complementary and not contradictory. So this is the key here that we wanna go on with. 
So a simplified version is basically suffering usually leads to disturbing emotions and karma, but we can prevent it with the re wisdom realizing emptiness. If we don't prevent it and disturbing emotions and karma are about to lead to suffering, we can purify it with the wisdom realizing emptiness. So before there was all those different techniques from the relative perspective, you know, you got your lojong and you got your, your compassion and you got your single pointed concentration and tons of methods. Here we're just simplifying it and saying, you can prevent and you can purify using the wisdom realizing emptiness. So it's very efficient, but only if you understand it. <laughs> so to realize emptiness, we start with understanding dependent arising. Dependent arising is the reason why things are empty. So most of you know this, but emptiness is not just emptiness without a referent. Yeah, it's always something is empty of what inherent existence. And emptiness is referring to something having the characteristic of emptiness. So the word is tricky. The word leads us to nihilism. Don't let it. <laughs> Remember, that's not what we're talking about in Buddhism. So absolutely everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. This is called the king of reasons proving the middle way between nihilism and absolutism, eternalism. So this is the thing to keep coming back to. Everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises, which makes you really curious about dependent arising. So this, um, this explanation is from Geshe Ngawan Samton at Vajrayana Institute in Sydney or Ashfield, a uh, suburb of Sydney. And it's a pretty universally agreed upon definition. So we've got this dependent arising, which in Tibetan is tendrel. And this then refers to dependent, indicating that things exist in dependence on other factors. Those factors could be causes and conditions, the parts in the whole, and dependence on being posited through the process of labeling. And we'll come back to that. Drell, arising, is if something is an arising, this means that it arises due to its relationship with something else. So the words to look at here are dependent on and relationship with. Yeah, everything is dependent on a number of things and has a relationship with a number of things. And I think, you know, there's a lovely quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. He says, we're here to awaken from our illusion of separateness. And I think that's beautiful and true and poetic. The danger is we think, oh, then we're all one. We're one. And you get kind of, you know, a little bit, I don't know, new agey, bless their hearts. And it's almost as if we're one, but we're not like one big lump all merged together. It's much more like we're an infinitely interconnected network. And we all have individual mind streams with individual karma, but we're all so completely tangled up together. It is very hard to say where I stop and you begin and where you stop and someone else begins. We're all, you know, interconnected in this way. And to think of emptiness as like the space of infinite possibility can help prevent you from feeling nothingness, right? It's the space of po potentiality and possibility. So dependence itself um, can refer to meeting, a coming together as in cause and effect, reliance as in something being contingent on something else, and dependence as we normally understand it, meaning not independent. Okay, so this first meeting, uh, meeting can be a tricky word, so I thought to just kind of talk about it, this first one. Uh, Geshla says, the function of um, the first understanding of dependence refers to causes and their results, the function of the destruction of the cause, and the generation of the result occurring simultaneously. 
So you consider the example of like a seed and a sprout. So it's through the function of the seed being destroyed that the function of the plant sprouting comes about. So it's the meeting of those two functions like that. Yeah, the scales also help you understand it within one moment of time. So cause and effect, they, they go like this. As one finishes, the other begins simultaneously. So then we talk about reliance, reliance upon, collection of parts. And this second understanding is far more inclusive than the first because it encompasses all phenomena, both permanent and impermanent. The first one only refers to impermanent, changeable things. And this understanding of dependence is also accepted by the mind only school in the middle way autonomous school. So for those of you that know a little bit about tenants, um, this is a premise held in common with those folks. We're talking from the perspective of the middle way consequence school, which of course we think is the highest school um, and is related to the second turning of the wheel that the heart sutra is included within. The third understanding Within dependent arising is the idea of dependence upon the process of being merely labeled by the mind. There is a basis upon which one labels and a mind which labels onto that basis. And in dependence upon these two, the labeled phenomena comes into existence. It is in this way that phenomena are dependent on being merely labeled by the mind. And this final understanding of dependence is completely unique to the highest Buddhist philosophical school, the consequentialist school of the middle way or the Prasangika Madhyamaka. Okay, so these levels of dependent arising are the relative conventional nature of things for valid consciousness or like worldly convention. So basically not someone's consciousness who is got some distortion by illness or drugs. This is the kind of accurate relative. So just have a look here. It's just these three levels. Um, and this is Geshitashi Sering's framing, um, which is also fairly common. So we've got causal dependency, which is just impermanent things. Mutual dependency, which it relates to both impermanent and permanent things and merely labeled dependency, which is related to both impermanent and permanent things. So these are the way things are dependent. Things are dependent, therefore they're empty. They're empty, therefore they're de dependent. This relates to everything. Specifically, we look at it related to the self. But if you look at just these three, causal, mutual, merely dependent, do you have questions so far? Do you want to mold out? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, See, I had a, just a question. See, I had a, um, uh, this dependency, the the uh, of emptiness. What I just could gather is a uh, thing is empty. Uh -huh. Oh, you froze for a minute, love. I can't hear you. Because yeah. it is uh, suppose I am um, suppose I have an attachment with some like suppose I am attached with this pen. So you mean to say that I am uh, this pen does not exist, or no. like then? No. So this is the point, right? Is that to be empty does not mean non-existent. Okay. Empty doesn't mean. Okay non-existent. So we have to like drill that in because the word empty in English and in Tibetan and in Sanskrit, you know, the word empty is a tricky word. Yeah. So of course it makes sense that you would go down that way. But remember, we're always talking about things being empty of a certain characteristic, not having a certain characteristic. What's the characteristic that they don't have? Inherence. Yeah. Okay. And if inherence is a problematic word, start with independence, 
nothing has a hundred percent independence and nothing has 100 percent self-existence so take for example um pain is a good one right so whatever is going on with your neural transmitters whatever is going on with your physiology there is an experience arising and if you were to rate your pain from one to ten you might say that is an eight and someone else experiencing the same pain might say it's a 10 or a five, right? So it is pain, but it's not pain from its own side or inherently existent, the worst kind or the least kind. It all exists within a context. And I think, you know, the simplest way to understand this is to realize we already do kind of get this because we understand how opinions work. Right. So you could start with like, this is a cup. No one is arguing. This is a cup. There are many different ways of saying cup in very dis different languages, but the concept of it holds liquid is a universal thing, right? It holds liquid. No argument. That's a conventional reality. It's not an ultimate reality, but it's conventional. But the problem is, is then we have, it is a good cup. <laughs> it is a bad cup. It is my cup, it is your cup. This is red, not maroon. This is burgundy. This is, you know, whatever, right? So you have layers and layers and layers on top of this, which before analysis feel very reasonable. This is my cup because I'm holding it. But then my family would say, no, that's our cup. You're just visiting. <laughs> You're just borrowing our cup. I'll be like, no, it's my cup right? It feels true until you analyze it, right? And so that surface level of opinion we get, right? Just, you know, we're smart people, we understand opinions are just opinions, and they come from history and conditioning and society and yada, 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 right? But then go deeper and say, is it a cup from its own side, just the cupness? It fulfills the function of it, no problem. But where is the cup exactly? Where is it? And you point and you say, no, that's, that's the handle. And you point, no, that's the round part. And you point, that's a piece of paint, point. That's a piece of ceramic. Anything that you point to is a part. Yeah. Of the, of the cup. Exactly. Yeah. And so there is no cup divorced from its parts. There is no cup from its own side. Right? It's not like there was a little magic cup that then gathered ceramic to it <laughs> and built itself. Right? There's no, there's no kind of like, there was a little outline there and then it sort of like magnetically attracted all of its pieces and self-assembled. And who cares? It's a cup. We don't need to split hairs, but it does matter for the self. Right? Because it kind of feels like there was a magical self, like a little... Um, core of a magnet drawing things to it or an outline that got filled up or some weird idea of i don't know a tiny self maybe at the heart chakra like driving things you know it's it's interesting how we view the self but it's the same as the cup where conventionally we can say this this and this is true people agree with it but where is that yeah. And that's why we use dependent arising to help our investigation. Yeah, so that first level, causal dependency, dependent upon causes and conditions, that's kind of the realm of karma that we were talking about yesterday. But in a simple way, you can say everything has a substantial cause, which is of a similar type. Everything has coactive conditions, which allow for it to function or ripen. Going more deeply, let's look at parts and whole, right? For something to be a whole, like a whole body or a whole person, it depends on having parts. But then the idea of parts also depend on the concept of a whole that something has parts of. There, it's also contextual, right? So I can say, for example, I am a tall person because I am five foot 10. But then I will visit my friend Tenzin Choki, who is like six foot three, and I am now a regular sized person and she is a tall person, right? It's only contextual. 
or this is the small room because the room over there is bigger. But if this room was at most Dharma centers, this would be the big room, <laughs> right? So it's all, it's, it's referent, isn't it? And our mind already gets this on some level, doesn't it? But it forgets it in the moment of attachment, anger. Yeah. As soon as you're angry, you think this person is bad from their own side or their behaviors are innately bad and disagreeable from their own side. Forgetting that those same behaviors wouldn't affect you the same way on a different day let alone affect someone else in the same way, right? You know, and you just think about your life. Think about your life. Think about when we, we used to travel more, right? Think about that. I remember one time I was um, in the subway um, in New Delhi and it was crowded and we were all going through the line to get on the train and um, it was chaotic. And then I went to... Moscow, like two weeks later, and it was orderly. And I remembered that I was curious about my reaction to crowds, because one was a chaotic crowd, and one was a tidy orderly crowd. And if I was in America, I would have a certain expectation. But because I was in countries that were not my countries, I had a more open mind. So the chaos of India was sort of fun. And the orderliness of Moscow was sort of fun because I was in the mood for newness. But in my own country, I would have an expectation of people get off this way and they get on this way and they organize themselves this way. And if they don't, they're bad and people suck, right? <laughs> and my own affliction is self-created. You know, my own agitation, my own stress level feels like it's because there was a crowd, but my relationship to crowds differs. So how can I say the crowd made me feel this way? The crowd was a condition, but they weren't the substantial cause. So suppose we have a different kind of relationship with a different person. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the pain which one person can give, uh, uh, you know, like uh, we get very affected by a pain given by a very near ones. Sure. But the same thing, if it happens from the outsider, we tend to like not be affected though that much. So exactly. if it is like that, then why is that person in our life? Then that person should not be. I mean, <laughs> well, that's another conversation, but, but kind of drill down even further, right? Yeah. Drill down even further to, okay, this say someone yelling at you in a critical way, when it's your best friend, it hurts. When it's a stranger, it triggers compassion the same yeah. words, the same volume. Okay. Yeah. Then you think the friend yelling at me, if I am calm has a different effect than if I'm not calm. The effect is different. If I know what's going on for them, if I knew they had a terrible day, they just broke up with their spouse. They had a terrible boss. They had this, they had that. And they yell at me. I just give them a big hug and say, do you need a meal? Do you need a cup of tea? Do you want to like chill on the couch? You know, it's been a bad day. Right, and you're not mad at them at all. You're just like, of course, you know? If you don't know what went on for them in their day, you think, how are you yelling at me? I'm your friend, how dare you? You know, so it's not like even from the same person with the same relationship, it affects you the same every single time. The issue I'm trying to, to explain to you is that we feel like what is happening is true from our own perspective that our own perspective is the only truth there is. And our perspective isn't even the only truth there is for us, <laughs> let alone for everyone else. And knowing that relaxes you. Knowing that helps you not buy into the story. You know, you have a little bit more space for detachment to say context is key. Yeah, context is key. And my own reactions, I can be kind about, I can be accepting of, I can be supportive of my own reactions, but my own reactions are not really just about this moment. My reactions are conditioned. And I wouldn't always react this way. If it was two degrees colder or two degrees hotter, it, was, it would be a different reaction. If I had low blood sugar or high blood sugar, it'd be a different reaction. 
right? Many different things influence how we feel, but we choose just one thing and say, that's why. And that's an exaggeration. Yeah. There are a million reasons why, and none of them are self-existent whys. Yeah. Um, someone with a raised hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Is it um, Shristi? Shristi? Yeah, correct. No, it's okay. It's Shristi. I'm correct. Shristi. Thanks. For yeah, I'm sorry my camera is off for now, but my question um, goes with context and I am um, like, I, I believe the fact that sometimes people have to be really quick in deciding something. Mm. And uh, do you think that this need for context to be the key can sometimes like cause our detachment from the self and people make it an excuse that, okay, I do not know the context to this, so I will just be indecisive about this. and then there is a, a whole different level of suffering in that for me and for the other people too, who I'm like representing or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty universal experience, isn't it? This like paralysis of being overwhelmed by not having all the information, so then you can't act. That's, that's a pretty common thing, isn't it? And, or to just act very quickly with, this is what I assume to be true, even though I know there's more to the story, I just have to act. So there's the kind of extreme of overacting and underacting that we can get into if we trap ourselves and needing to understand all the reasons why. You know, and this was a fault of, you know, psychology 50 years ago, right? Was this idea that you could get to the bottom of it right? Like if you could just sort out all of your family of origin issues, you could understand why you are the way you are, right? Like if my mother did this and my father did this and their parents and their parents and ancestral trauma and blah, blah, blah. That's why I can't sleep at night. You know, that's it. I found it. And you could get to the bottom of it. There was kind of this, like, maybe not in all forms of psychology, maybe just pop psychology, you know, 20, 30, 50 years ago. But there was a sort of illusion that you could get to the bottom of it. And that could make you paralyzed and not able to move forward with your life until you sorted it all out. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do those investigations. I think it's really useful of, oh, I have this habit from this and this habit from that. It's good to know. But I have to live my life in the meantime and I'll never get to the bottom of it. So you're kind of in this, I'm investigating but I can't actually get all the way to beginningless time until I'm a Buddha. So, you know, I make an educated guess. So similarly with your example, it's like you can't know the context for everything and you do have to act. How do you do that? You do that from the place of all I can control is my own motivation. And I can only control my own motivation if I remember to, you know, so we need mindfulness but not just any kind of mindfulness, we need bodhicitta mindfulness. So we need this mindfulness that is aware of what we're thinking, doing and saying with the background kind of container of, is it in alignment with working for the welfare of all sentient beings? You know, so you're not just like, I am walking, I am walking, I am sitting, I am sitting, not like that. <laughs> you know, it's what am I thinking and is it in alignment with my path or not? And when it's not, I just gently nudge it back into line, you know? And if you can catch your negative moods when they're small, it's very easy to adjust them. Once they escalate, it's much harder. So we want this mindfulness with an agenda, a checking agenda to see, am I staying with bodhicitta or not? And so all you can do is say, all right, in this moment, what I want is happiness and relief of suffering, for myself and all sentient things. The details, I'm just gonna have to make an educated guess. I'm just gonna have to make an educated guess because otherwise we will get paralyzed and it's, it's natural and human, but you know that everyone has a backstory. You don't have to know what it is. You've lived long enough to know everyone has a story and their behaviors make sense given their context. 
You don't have to even know what that story in context is anymore to have compassion. It's almost like once you know someone's story, you can't help but have compassion. But right now we can't see everyone's story, so then we don't have compassion for them. Yeah, but can we kind of take what we already do know and make it a little bit more universal and do that spreading? You know, I always think about in the, what, the 90s when those prequels to Star Wars came out, remember? Those awful prequels, anyway, they did their best. Um, but we found out all the reasons behind Darth Vader and now Darth Vader's not so scary, you know? But when you're a little kid and you first see Darth Vader, it's like, oh my gosh, he's so scary. But you hear the backstory and you're like, oh, that's so poignant, <laughs> right? It ruins all bad guys. Backstory ruins all bad guys. So all the bad guys in your life have their backstory. They have their origin story, right? It's just tricky because we kind of feel like we need to know what it is in order to let them off the hook. And you don't really. All right. I don't know, does that help or do you want to ask a follow-up? Go ahead. Yeah, no, it does help a lot. Contextualizing doesn't always look right because no matter how um, awakened we are we're still in a time frame that we share mm -hmm. so we have to be um, skillful with our mindfulness so yeah thanks yeah. thanks a lot helps a lot yeah so just kind of let it let it brew and we'll have a, a five minute break and uh, stretch our legs and whatever and then we'll come back and do a meditation on these three levels of dependency and hopefully it will kind of make a bit more sense and settle in so um five minutes and uh, see you soon
Come on back. Okay, so are you all back? I can't quite see. Send me an emoji if I can't see your head. <laughs> <What's up? clears throat> emoji, emoji. Okay. All right, so get yourself into a nice posture for meditation. Nice straight back and try and sit in such a way that you're not slumped forward or leaning back. If your back is bothering you, it's okay to lay down, but uh, try and have that straight spine if you can. And if you are healthy, try and develop that discipline of a straight back. And just shift for a minute in your seat until you find that good balanced way of sitting where it feels like your spine is self-supporting. So with your bum just a little bit higher than your knees or maybe in your something in your chair to lift you a bit towards the back. And before we start the analytical meditation, we'll just do a few minutes of single pointed meditation on the breath. And so just for a moment, reconnecting with your motivation, the purpose of my life, to free all living beings from suffering, bring them complete happiness. In order to do this, I need to look within at cause and effect. I need to develop this mind to its fullest potential. To facilitate that, I meditate today. May the work on this cushion have a ripple effect, an ongoing energy. And you can phrase that into your own words, but connect with altruism. And to the breath. Just watching the breath without any agenda. Not agreeing with your own thoughts or disagreeing with your own thoughts. Just let them play out in the background. Keep attention on the breath. If you feel yourself getting lost in your thoughts, 
just gently pull back out and place your focus back on the breath. No big deal. Just keep coming back. And now shift to analysis and start with this big statement, this king of reasons, all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. What impression does that have on your mind? everything empty because it's dependent. And then making it less abstract and more personal, bring your focus to your own body sitting here right now. And just say to yourself in your mind, this is my body, my body, mine. And it is. Mostly. It is relatively. But go a little bit deeper into the causal dependency. What was the cause of this body? What made it? Was it me or something else? Is my body made of me? Did I make my own body? And your mind goes into science and you remember what you know about genetics and biology, and you think, okay, this body was based on the materials from my mother and father, 
was based on countless meals, food grown by others, often prepared by others. Shared air, shared water. Countless causes and conditions for this body to be here now. No self-existent cause. No partless particle that started it all. Nothing independent. How does that land, that idea? That you know scientifically and logically that this body that is yours wasn't made by you or even just one thing. What does that do to your relationship to your own body to think that? And this body is also dependent upon parts and whole. Whole is dependent on parts. To attribute your own name to this body, there has to be something to label upon. So from a distance, you can say, that's my body. That's their body. But the closer you get, the more you realize that label is placed upon parts. There is no body there in and of itself. There are bones, there is blood, there is muscles skin, all of which also have parts, which have parts, which have parts. This is only my body in relationship there has to be existence of other for me to say that. What is mine for me is other to others. This body might be considered tall in one culture and short in another, attractive in one culture, unattractive in another. The ideal weight or the not ideal weight, completely contextual, 
nothing real there from its own side. Ideas of masculine and feminine. All existing within a context. And this is still just the body. What about the mind? What about the self? So just as the body is dependent upon causes and conditions, upon parts and context, so too the mind is dependent upon causes and conditions, upon parts and context. And so just explore a little bit more deeply how that might be. Because it is the body and the mind that we label self onto. So what is it we're labeling onto? Where is it? What is it? Substantial cause of mind, the previous moment of mind. Countless parts of the mind, Six primary consciousnesses, 51 main mental factors, 84,000 different delusions, the mind has so many aspects and components, positive and negative, it exists, but where exactly, how exactly? So just do an investigation. Be curious about what you find. No need to rush to a conclusion. Let it be an open question. What is the mind? Where is the mind? How is the mind? And how does it feel to think the self is that which is merely labeled on those collections? The collections I label body on, the collections I label mind on, the self is only that which is merely labeled there. 
And anything extra or more or core or permanent is an exaggeration. Is not there. and dedicate all of the merit you put into this session to realizing both bodhicitta and the wisdom realizing emptiness, and that all of that go towards your enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Gone, gone to Pelwasho, Tony Dawarim Boshe, Marke Panam Kayuachi, Kevan Yam Bame Bai, Gone, gone to Pelwasho. And you can relax your attention. Okay, so we'll have an hour's break and uh, that's so the folks in Toronto can have lunch. So if you're not in Toronto and you have a different time frame, you have an hour break for whatever. Um, if you have immediate kind of questions and you don't want to lose them, go ahead and write them in the chat and I'll do my best. Um, the follow up is a really good reading is the essence of the Heart Sutra by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and how to see yourself as you really are by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Those are two really excellent readings um, for both kind of beginners, but also intermediate, advanced. Um, they're really fantastic. And then that Foundation of Buddhist Thought series by Geshe Tashi Sering, he's got two excellent titles. One is Emptiness, and one is Ultimate Truth and Relative Truth. So anyway, before I forget, those are two recommended readings, and I'll see you in an hour. Thanks, guys.